This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. You've got before you 1960. You've got some of the prices from 1960. Look at the population of the United States, only 180 million at that time. Look at the Dow Jones. Dow Jones high was 685. The low was only 566. Federal spending under $100 billion. The national debt was under $300 billion. Look at that inflation rate. 1.4% unemployment, 5.5%. Of course, economists tell us that about 5% is the structural unemployment rate most of the time through our history, uh, you know, as the buggy whip makers are phased out. And then you have some of the prices. I think the cost of a new home, $16,500. Uh, stamp, only four cents. Gallon of milk, 49 cents. Really amazing. And then if you turn the page, you'll see some of the music. Remember uh, the twist, Chevy Checker? Yeah. Uh, you, you've got some, some great music there. Actually, it's had some staying power. Best new artist was Bob Newhart in 1960. And if you look at some of the movies, uh, pretty much wholesome fare, Exodus, Inherit the Wind. Uh, the apartment got a little racy since it was for trysts. And then you have Psycho. Uh, Billy Wilder was winning Best Director and Best Picture in 1960. And then you go to TV shows. Look at some of those TV shows. Such threatening, culturally threatening fare as Gunsmoke and uh, Wagon Train and Have Gun, remember Have Gun, Will Travel? Mm -hmm. Paladin, The Real McCoys, Rawhide, remember Laughing to Candid Camera? Mm -hmm. But those were the top TV shows. 77 Sunset Strip, Ed Sullivan, Perry Mason, Bonanza, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And then if you look at the sports, you know, it just gives you a little bit of an idea of you know, who won the World Series that year. And it looks like it's Pittsburgh. And uh, a Detroit Lion actually made uh, the most valuable player in the pros. Uh, Joe Schmidt, the linebacker, that year. You've got that. And then the books, well, you've got a little bit of a political flavor there and advice and consent by Alan Drury. But Hawaii by James Michener. And I love the nonfiction. Oh, look at this. The General Foods Kitchens Cookbook. A bestseller. Better Homes and Gardens Dessert Book. Uh, and the Conscience of a Conservative. Ghost written by Brent Bozell, who worked at National Review, and uh, presented by Barry Goldwater as an alternative to Eisenhower on the right. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. Now, there's not a whole lot in these pages that would disturb you or a culture. And let me just ask you to get things started. Do you think a country that has that profile that you see right here is in pretty good shape? Is it a country that you think is fairly happy? Also recall that we had started to make progress in civil rights legislation. We had uh, also confronted in Little Rock race discrimination in some of the southern cities, Central High School. So already, the United States was beginning that self-examination. We had just fought a major war, World War II, liberating other people, and of course Americans came back home and said, why don't we liberate the people right here in our midst? So you have really a, a growing social consciousness, and it's not on this list, but you most certainly have interest in culture. The Beat Generation, remember the Beatniks? And you had Allen Ginsberg and uh, you had Jack Kerouac. Truly, there was ferment in the 1950s, and a healthy ferment. But I can't help but read to you what Jack Kerouac said. This is how non-threatening the cultural ferment of the late 50s and 1960 was. Jack Kerouac, quote, We love everything. Billy Graham, The Big Ten, Rock and Roll, Zen, Apple Pie, Eisenhower, we dig it all. <laughs> that's the 19, that's the scene for the 1960 election. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I don't think it's, it's uh, unbecoming to, uh, or cop out to be a little bit nostalgic for a time like that that was most definitely, um, wholesome and had political stability and a 
great economy that's going with great guns. And in the midst of all this, you have a president who is extremely popular coming to the scene. Dwight David Eisenhower, our 34th commander in chief. You cannot understand the American presidency. You cannot understand the history of the 20th century in America. And you cannot understand the most horrific war in human history without knowing the biography of Dwight D. Eisenhower. He's a fascinating figure. There's something for everyone in Eisenhower. One reason his story is compelling is that on June 6, 1944, he was the most powerful human being on Earth. And we'll take a little bit of time to develop that point. Another reason he's interesting is that he represents the end of a tradition. Now let me ask you, when was the last time we had a general become president? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Now, that's, that's 58 years ago. How many years before that do you have to go to find a, a uh, well, let me word the question differently. How many presidents do you think had been generals before becoming president? Six or seven. Five. <laughs> Us? Eleven presidents were general before they were president of the United States. In fact, Eisenhower is our 34th president. So if you look at the 33 presidents, the 33 men who served as president, actually be 32 men because Grover Cleveland came back uh, a second time. So if you look at the 32 men who had been president, you look at the 30, fact that 30 of the 32, 11 of them had been general. One out of three presidents, a little better than one out of three presidents, had been a general before he was president. So he's the end of a tradition. Americans used to love to have presidents who had served in the military and gone all the way to the top of the army. Uh, just for your information, a little uh, list here. Those 11 are George Washington, Andrew Jackson, William Henry Harrison, Zach Taylor, Andrew Johnson, uh, U.S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, and Eisenhower. So it was a hallowed tradition in our country. Now, Truman would remark of Eisenhower, when Eisenhower won the election, that he would never know what hit him when he reached his desk in the White House. As a general, when he gave an order, it would be obeyed instantly. But in the White House, he would give an order and nothing would happen. <laughs> Can you imagine? And this could have uh, frustrated Eisenhower a great deal if that, in fact, had been true. But we will see that Eisenhower is very ingenious in the way that he set up his, his office. It ran like an army operation, as you would expect. Eisenhower represents the beginning of another tradition. He really, truly helped usher us into the modern presidency. He's the president who invents the chief of staff in the presidency. Uh, people had presidential assistants and dominating assistants before that, but no one officially was chief of staff. Anyone here remember who Eisenhower's chief of staff was? Sherman Adams. Sherman Adams, that's right. Very good. And boy, did he exercise his role uh, with an iron fist. He was called the second most powerful man in Washington, almost virtually a co-president because of the access that he controlled to the president. But the second reason that Eisenhower is so important, as remembered in terms of the modern presidency, is that he could be characterized as maintaining the hidden hand presidency. Fred Greenstein wrote a very important book that revised our view of, of Eisenhower to see that Eisenhower was really much more active behind the scenes and through Sherman Adams in conveying what he wanted done than has generally been given credit. Now, scholars discovered this about 15 years ago. The general public still needs to kind of catch up with the latest scholarship on uh, Eisenhower's truly active presidency. He's a fascinating figure in the history of the presidency, and I hope to show you that the, the cliche about him just basically being a golfer in the Oval Office is terribly unfair to him and doesn't really get us very far in our understanding either of American history or the way the presidency evolved after World War II. Eisenhower is also an interesting figure because he was so doggone prophetic. 
Now, there have only been two farewell addresses in the history of the United States given by presidents that really made an impact. One of them was by Washington. He, in fact, sets the precedent for giving the farewell address. And we remember Washington's farewell address because he talks about how important it is that America avoid contact or uh, alliances that would take down our interests somehow. If you don't have American property and lives and honor at stake, we shouldn't get involved in foreign alliances. The term that's often mistakenly used to quote Washington from his farewell address is entangling alliances. That's Jefferson's phrase later. Washington did not technically use that phrase, but we understand it means the same thing as what he intended to say in his farewell address in 1796. So the second farewell address that is, is well known to Americans is Eisenhower's. All those years between Washington and Eisenhower, there really wasn't a truly memorable farewell address until Ike comes along. And do you remember the famous phrase in Eisenhower's farewell address where he warns us against the military, military industrial, industrial complex? complex. Yeah. Now, I remind you, this is a general. This is a man who had spent his entire career in the Army. And I remind you that when he takes the presidency, of Columbia University, the reason he becomes president of Columbia there on Manhattan is so that he can be introduced to the business leaders of the United States. This is a man who understood and was sympathetic to the military and understood and was sympathetic to the industrial uh, society, to General, General Motors uh, had its, its CEO taken away. Charles Wilson came over to be the Secretary of Defense. So Eisenhower was sympathetic with the military and industry, but he realized any great entity can become its own vested interest. And then it sometimes will try to act in its interest and not the true national interest. And that's what he wondered. And that was just his warning, somewhat prophetic, that uh, this is government, as it has gotten larger since the Progressive Era, has tended to become its own vested interest and lobbies for itself in Congress, for example, get appropriations. The military industrial complex has done the same. So Eisenhower is very prophetic to see this. And it's a little bit like Nixon to China. It takes an anti-communist to go to China. It takes an inside military guy to see the military industrial complex. Finally, Eisenhower has something for everybody because a woman named Kay Summersby. Does everybody know about Kay? She is the woman who allegedly had an affair with Eisenhower in World War II, and Eisenhower got in a heap of trouble, reportedly, with his superiors because of this affair. So Eisenhower has it all. Talk about our mini-series. We should just roll it out because it would be a great mini-series, and we could pull it off without error showing Ike holding a golf club. <laughs> Now let's look at some of the specifics of leadership. And to do this, I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to show you a little bit of something about what I teach in my leadership seminars. It's called the Leadership Life Cycle. And because today is such a beautiful day, I'm going to use green. The Leadership Life Cycle. When you talk about where leaders come from and how they develop, how they evolve as leaders, the scholars and the people who do presentations on leadership workshops like to break it down usually into several components. So usually there's some component about leading the self. Then there's usually something said about learning how to be a follower, letting others lead, follow them. And then there's usually something said about uh, leading teams. And then you evolve from leading the self and leading teams and some kind of apprenticeship to leading organizations, the biggest unit of all. Finally, in the education and in the growth of any leader is crisis, where the leader has to confront perhaps his darkest demons, his most terrifying phantoms, real or imagined, where he's required 
to lead virtuously and effectively through a very difficult decision. A decision he does not want to make, but he has to. And sometimes he will make the wrong decision and has to reap the consequences. And when that happens, and it happens to every leader at some point in his or her career, the crisis forces you back to looking right here at yourself. What do I have to do to change myself? Okay, now, it's with this leadership life cycle that I'd like to take a look at Eisenhower's life <clears throat> and to see what kind of leader he evolved into, this will be our, our working model for uh, the time I have with you. First of all, let's look at Ike's definition of leadership. He said it's the ability to decide what is to be done and then to get others to want to do it. Now that's a very shrewd definition of leadership because it has two key components in it. First of all, the ability to decide. You cannot be a leader if you cannot make tough decisions. Eisenhower knew that, and we're going to show in just a few minutes how Eisenhower's toughest decisions came about and how strongly he, uh, he prepared for those and was willing to accept the consequences. It's the ability to decide what is to be done and then get others to want to do it. You know, if a leader turns around and looks over his shoulder there's no one behind him, he's obviously not a leader. So to get people to want to do what you see is necessary is the key here. Now let's look at a little more depth in leading oneself and how Eisenhower managed that. To lead oneself requires such virtues as courage, to see yourself as you really are, as honesty. Humility to say, okay, I'm not perfect. I have issues that I need to work on. And the determination to change your worst first nature to a better second nature. Everybody, we say, is born with their first nature. And you know how we just say in English, that became second nature? Well, something becomes second nature by practice and habitual action or habitual pattern of thought. Eisenhower was aware of this early on, that he had to change some aspects of the nature he was born with or that formed early in his childhood to become a more effective person. We'll, we'll go into this in some, some detail. For example, uh, the Eisenhower family had six boys. He was the third. If you've gone to Abilene, Kansas, and you actually see the house in which he grew up, it's a small house. You can't imagine how you have six boys, eight people in all, in this house that's not very big at all. <clears throat> it's a little house because the father fell on hard times. Uh, after the Panic of 1893, Eisenhower was born in 1890. Panic of 1893, which in some ways is worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. Panic of 1893 really devastated the Eisenhower household. And he was born in Texan, Texas in Denison, uh, one of the reasons I wore my Texas tie uh, tonight. And his father finds a job in a creamery up in Abilene, Kansas. Now, the family will never recover economically uh, to be a very strong middle-class family economically during Eisenhower's childhood. But the family was sustained by hard work, frugality, a good work ethic, and faith. Now, the combo of formal education and economic adversity would be a potent recipe for ambition. Why the education? Because both of Eisenhower's parents, including the mom, which was somewhat unusual in that day, uh, had considerable college background. And so, even though there was economic adversity, they, they could plant the seeds of advancement in their children. Now, Ike, it has to be said, was a late bloomer. He did not realize what potential he had until he was forced to work hard in the Army. He didn't work hard in, in West Point. We'll go into that in just a minute. But there was something in him that even his classmates saw when he was in Yale. Because the high school yearbook there in Abilene said, predicted, that Ike would be a history professor at Yale University. Now, that's an interesting prediction. Eisenhower loved to read history, and I think his reading of history and his reading of, of about great men in particular, his reading of Herodotus and Thucydides and Romans, Sallust and Livy and Tacitus, the classics, 
Plutarch's lives, his great reading inspired in him uh, a desire to do something great in his life. It just wasn't visible yet when he was young. He had to learn to discipline himself and lead himself to these good books and to think about how to work that influence into his life. It turns out that he was an excellent writer. That also requires extreme self-discipline, as anybody who's worked hard to master writing knows. You know, to write requires concision, usually, and it requires a, an economy and a clarity of thought. Eisenhower, again, was extremely fortunate to have developed these qualities. In fact, he was asked to write essentially the battlefield Bedecker Guide of the World War I battlefields. Of all the people in the Army who could have done it, he was the one selected. And get this, he did not even serve abroad in France or Belgium in World War I. And yet, he was selected to write that guide, that battlefield guide for the Army, his colleagues, to study the order of battle and the terrain and how battles uh, progressed during that war, the Great War. It was also so tragic. Another piece of writing that I love to point out, we have it in our Hallenstein Center Library. He asked his, his officers to write a history of the World War, the Second World War, in three pages. Can you imagine the decision that was necessary for that? World War II in three pages is the title of the book. We have it. Do you have a copy of that, Larry? I have to look. <laughs> okay. The footnotes are much longer than the, the actual <laughs> essay, as you can imagine. But the thing that people mostly think of when they think of Eisenhower leading, learning to lead himself, conquer himself, was his hot temper. And his mother told the story of when he was a boy, I think he was only about six or seven years old, and he was really upset one Halloween. And he went out and he was pounding, thrashing this, this tree, I think it was a peach tree or something. And he comes back in with a bruised and bloody hand, and his mother said, now look at what you've done. Do you think you hurt the tree? All you ended up doing by losing your, your temper was hurting yourself. So his mother was fundamental in getting the boy to learn how to conquer himself. She was a great influence on him. Also, in terms of conquering himself, Eisenhower was always known as an amiable man very pleasant, winsome personality, a delight to be around. But he always wasn't that way. Not only did he have this hot temper, not only did he have maybe a, a bit of a, a lack of apparent ambition when he was a young man, it looked like he'd have a far piece to go before he would accomplish anything, but he also was prone to depression and sullenness when um, things didn't go well. Uh, the upbeat image came out of the story that I'm about to tell you. Stephen Ambrose writes about this in his biography of Eisenhower. Anybody here been to Gibraltar, the Rock of Gibraltar? When you are in Gibraltar, of course the Americans went there in 1942 as a way to prepare for that campaign across northern Africa and into Sicily and Italy and the soft underbelly of Fortress Europe, as Churchill called it. Well, Eisenhower has to set up his headquarters down there in Gibraltar. It, it is literally a whole network of big caves, and even today you can go and see where the Allied uh, command is. And it's dark, and it's dank, and it's a depressing environment, and day after day, Eisenhower and the soldiers around him, the officers, were giving him terrible reports about, oh, you know, we're gonna have this tough time as we face Rommel, you know, uh, we're likely to lose this battle if we do this. You know, uh, our soldiers aren't as well prepared or as, as uh, professional at this point, as experienced as the German. Wehrmacht, we're going to have all kinds of problems. And Eisenhower realized one day, this is not healthy. You know, he saw, the first thing he did, which was important, is he realized that he was the leader. And it was important for him to set a tone. So he made the conscious decision to put on a game face every morning that was much more upbeat and optimistic. We can indeed do well. We are going to win this war, and it's going to start in North Africa. But he realized he had to take care of himself first. He knew what we all know, and the research has recently proven it. We all know 
we've all had the experience of being in a room full of people, and maybe the mood is sort of just, you know, neutral, and the life of the party comes in and picks everybody, everybody's mood up, and we all get in line with that, right? It's called our limbic system, our emotional system. We all get in line with this upbeat mood, and it's, it's uncanny the way we all line up unconsciously in a particular mood. All of you are probably relatively close in mood right now. You're really bored, or you're, you're but, but you're all the same. Well, and it's the same we know with when somebody who's really got a sour disposition comes into a room and brings everybody down. We've all seen this. I mean, everything's going great until the sour personality comes into the room, the angry personality and slams things down, and everybody gets quiet, and... You know, it just, we, we know this is a phenomenon and the um, psychological research has proven that this is so. So Eisenhower knew that as a leader, he could really almost arrange the emotional state of the people around him by the tone he set. Now that's a remarkable apprehension. We all have that power. How many of us act like leaders in the groups that we go into saying, you know what, I'm going to set a tone when I walk into this room? How many of us do it? He knew he had to do it. And that's where that big grin of his, I like Ike, that's the start of it. He knew that he could get people to relax, be at ease, even if things were tense. Eisenhower's smile comes from Gibraltar and that intuitive way of understanding our limbic systems and the importance of setting the right mood. Now, let's look at Ike as a follower and going through that part of the leadership cycle. Now, to be a follower, uh, you need some of the virtues that include the ability to check your ego at the door when you come in with a group of people. You need humility, and you also need to be able to listen on the hardest things for people to do. Eisenhower developed all of these skills he also had the ability to attract mentors. When you're in your following apprenticeship stage, you absolutely need to attract people who know and can teach you much more than you know. Eisenhower had wonderful mentors. He had a mentor, for example, in Fox Connor. When, uh, Eisenhower and Fox Connor were in Panama. Uh, Connor always gave Eisenhower a number of assignments to really sharpened his mind. He had him reading some of the classics, uh, you know, Thucydides and Prince. He had uh, Eisenhower prepare orders of battle. He had Eisenhower prepare huge logistical plans. This was all training. Every day, Connor had Ike do something. Connor saw in Eisenhower a remarkable human being, a very logical, organized mind who could do wonderful things if only he's given the right training. Uh, he did not do particularly well at West Point. In fact, I should go back to that page and tell you exactly what he did at West Point. Because you will be surprised. What is that? Indulge me for just a minute here. Eisenhower was was uh, not somebody who would have impressed people uh, initially in his life. Um, if you look at his childhood, there was nothing there or in his record at West Point that indicated future greatness. So what, what did Fox Connor see? Let's go back and look at what people before Fox Connor saw in I. He went to West Point to start his Army career, but not to start his Army career. <laughs> it was at the beginning of a 35 year brilliant career but he wasn't interested really in the Army so much as he was in playing football. That's what he liked doing in high school. So when he gets to West Point, he plays football until his, uh, his uh, sophomore year with an injury in a varsity game. They're welcome to come in if they would like. <laughs> They're peeking through the window and uh, jumping a little bit there. <laughs> That'll change the... The limbic system here. Yeah, That's yes. right. Larry's going to show them. <laughs> He's a lot bigger than they are. Yeah. So you've, you've got a, uh, a student who really is just there to play football, and then when he's injured, he doesn't really have anything to fall back on. 
uh, as, a, as, a, as a football player. He mocked his commander's orders to report to quarters in his full dress coat by wearing only his full dress coat and nothing underneath. <laughs> this was the high jinks that he loved to, to play. He was full of pranks. He also indulged in the weed. He liked tobacco, which was something that uh, was discouraged at West Point. So he, he uh, certainly raised eyebrows with that. And with a young lady at a dance one evening, he danced too informally, too salaciously with the young lady. Uh, and he was demoted from a sergeant to a private for that. So Eisenhower was a bit of a wild card. Uh, so when you have a Fox Connor say, okay, I know this guy was a little wild at West Point, but we're going to work with him. And Fox Connor also would have been aware that Eisenhower uh, graduated only 61st in his class, of a class of 164, in the middle third. You do not realize that this is going to be a brilliant writer, student of history, and brilliant reader in the future. I always like to ask audiences, if you were to take a snapshot of Eisenhower, right on the eve of his Fox Connor assignment in Panama, take that snapshot and look at what his life had led up to, coming from a family that was rather poor, had no political connections, had no, uh, no legacy of greatness as a... Uh, political and military leader in his family, and then doing so, such an average job at West Point. There is nothing there to show you that in just 30 years, he will be one of the most loved people on the face of the earth. So what happens in the 20s, when he's in his 20s, to get to the point he did? Well, he, uh, he learned to lead himself, he learned to follow people like Fox Connor and later General Marshall, and he also learned how to lead teams. Now, to lead a team, uh, it requires virtues like great emotional intelligence because teams are made up of people with whom the leader has a close personal relationship. Any basketball team, any football team, any Loudoun District Library would be that size, but you have a personal relationship with virtually everybody at your team. So you have to have the emotional intelligence to know how to push people when they need to be pushed uh, without breaking them, how to praise people when they need to be praised, what people require in circumstances that arise. And Eisenhower apparently had a, a, an excellent emotional intelligence and the ability to form intensely personal attachments with others. The Eisenhower presidency would become one of the most unusual in modern American history because neither he nor most of his top aides had previous experience in public office. Eisenhower didn't just take his clubby little group to Washington. He truly chose, he selected people to serve around him who were the very best. Again, this is part of his ability to assemble a team and to understand how uh, teams work. In no other 20th century presidential administration did the professional politician enjoy less prestige than in the Eisenhower administration. And think of the lessons that could be applied to, to so many of the subsequent presidencies, including down to today's. So Eisenhower became a great leader of a team. Leading an organization. Well, the virtues to lead an organization include understanding how the organization works and its environment, the ecology of the organization, how it depends on, how it, it dominates or shapes or otherwise adapts to its environment. It requires vision to lead, lead an organization. It requires the ability to communicate. Presidential historian David uh, Stevedy of Ohio State University writes, Eisenhower's presidency was highly competent, effective, and successful, the most so of any presidency since World War II. Now that is high praise from a presidential historian. The most competent, effective, and successful of any presidency. And it's because precisely of this ability to lead himself in crisis, to, to lead teams, to lead an entity as big as the Army or NATO or United States for the executive position, 
knowing when to step back and follow, and knowing how to deal with crisis. Eisenhower is the complete package in this leadership life cycle, and he has much to teach us all the way through. Now, let's look at how he led an organization. Let's look at how he led the Allies, since we have an, an anniversary we're getting close to, 66th anniversary of D-Day, June 6th, 1944. It's an important date in Eisenhower's life and also in the lives of millions of men and women. On June 6, 1944, Eisenhower was arguably the most, the most powerful, perhaps the most important man in the world on that day. He was the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, the hand-picked leader of Operation Overlord, the largest amphibious assault in human history. The Allies' mission to retake Western Europe from Hitler's Third Reich depended on the success of Operation Overlord. Now, in addition to being the largest amphibious assault in human history, Operation Overlord was the defining experience in the lives of millions of men, of men and women, including that of Eisenhower. And Eisenhower never forgot the human impact of D-Day and the days that followed. I'm going to read something that's, whose imagery is very striking and disturbing. In his wartime memoir, Crusade in Europe, I wrote of a hellish encounter with death after June 6th. Quote, I was conducted through the battlefield on foot to encounter scenes that could be described only by Dante. It was literally possible to walk for hundreds of yards at a time, stepping on nothing but dead and decaying flesh. Now, this translates into something. When Eisenhower viewed his soldiers, they were not what Santa Ana called Mexican soldiers before the Battle of the Alamo, mere chickens. Eisenhower saw the humanity of the men that he sent in battle. And nothing in his, poignant, in his life is more poignant than what he did on the eve of the June 6th invasion. When he left headquarters, the comfort of his headquarters and that nice little team of men he had assembled around him, they all enjoy personal relationship, emotional attachment, a game of poker, a good brandy. Well, he, uh, he left that. And he went to inspect the 101st Airborne Division. Military planners were anticipating that the 101st would suffer an 80% casualty rate. Eisenhower knew that. And it says much about his character that he wanted to go see the men whose death warrant he knew he was signing when he sent them into battle. You know, he wanted to look them in the eyes before going into combat, and that translated later when Eisenhower um, became our 34th president in 1952 and re-elected in 1956. Americans knew that they were choosing a man who was fully alive to the horrors of war. Ladies and gentlemen, where does this quality come from? That took guts, because he was fully prepared for defeat as well as victory. Not only did he know that most of those men would die in the 101st and many other units, but he knew that there would be no glory if they failed. He was acutely aware of this. There was a moment in this, and if you go back and you read some of the Eisenhower biographies, like the Ambrose, there's a moment when you see where he has to really buck himself up and lead himself to leave the comfort of headquarters to go look these men in the eye and give them the courage to fight tomorrow. Carl uh, Shaletto and Mike Tolhurst write in a book, D-Day and the Battle for Normandy. I'm going to quote this. This is a rather long passage, but it's, it shows an aspect of Eisenhower's leadership that I think is phenomenal. Would that we could find such people, uh, always in the Oval Office later, always leading us whenever we have a crusade to fight as we did in World War II. Quote, during the first few months of 1944, the south of England was transformed into a giant military base, 
Over three million soldiers, sailors, and airmen were training to play their part in the invasion of Europe. Headquarters and staff officers carefully coordinated and recorded the movement of every unit to ensure that the planned movement and embarkation of the fighting troops and transfer of their vital supplies would run with clockwork precision. With an initial assault force of over 170,000 men and 20,000 vehicles, it was a logistical nightmare for the planners involved, but Ike kept them all in line and coordinated. Over 1,000 supply vessels, 4,124 landing ships and craft would be used to transport the combat troops and their equipment across the channel. And for the protection of the naval convoys and to help soften up the German coastal defenses by naval bombardment, an additional 1,213 warships would sail with the Armada. Ladies and gentlemen, contemplate the numbers I just gave you, the millions of people, all coordinated because of Ike's orders. Now, I don't know about you, I can't even coordinate my three sons to take the garbage out on time. Eisenhower is coordinating, you know, men from three different continents, and he's doing an outstanding job as this master uh, conductor of, of Herculean proportions. No one on earth had ever attempted anything that audacious. Eisenhower rose to the challenge, and as we know, he succeeded brilliantly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can make fun of Eisenhower all you want as a golfer, but there's something upstairs. That kid who was predicted to be a future historian at Yale, and who met Charles Wilson, and met the people on Wall Street, and impressed them, and met with the Gaul, and uh, Churchill, and Monty, that man who would someday be in charge of NATO, this man had an organizational genius that was most unusual, and thank goodness he had it. We are all in his debt for the ability that he expressed. Was this ever apparent at West Point? The kid who came in 61st in his class, the kid who was just wearing an overcoat to mock his commander, the kid who snuck around the hall and smoked, the kid who salaciously danced with that girl, I guess they'd call it grinding today. How would you ever predict that such a person had the intellectual and moral fiber and the organizational genius to do something that no human being had ever done before on that scale? I'm not just talking about a doddering old man who's a golfer. D-Day required Eisenhower to develop an exceedingly important skill for his future life. Diplomacy. The Allies' coalition, as I said, was the most complex alliance in human history that nations had ever attempted. It was often under stress of fracturing, and Ike had to marry up these huge egos like FDR and Churchill, De Gaulle, Monty, Patton and his own army. It was a remarkable feat. And I was just naming a few of the more colorful. Less than a week before the invasion, Ike met with Churchill and de Gaulle in the Operation Overlord War Room, and de Gaulle was so furious with the public relations he was receiving. Can you believe it? He wanted the racist thaws to get more credit than it was. And he was just furious in there with Churchill, and Ike said, we need to calm down. So he led de Gaulle out into the rain where de Gaulle could, you know, raise his arms and flap his elbows. And Eisenhower apparently did a little arm waving too. The storm passed. The literal storm and the metaphorical storm passed. And the coalition held for the invasion. Read an account of this scene in David Eisenhower's wonderful book, very engaging biography of his grandfather, Eisenhower at War 1943-1945. Uh, it's on page 246. And read an account of this uh, from the eyes of the grandson. It really is inspiring. Eisenhower also had to learn to deal with the press before, during, and after D-Day. And he handled them truthfully, but shrewdly. He never did their homework for them. If some of the reporters were not alert enough to ask the questions they should have, so be it. Eisenhower would let those questions go in silence. Not, bad, not a bad skill for a future president of the United States to cultivate. 
I possessed another essential element of good leadership, and that was the willingness to accept full responsibility for his decisions and actions. This takes such courage. He was not going to blame other people. On the eve of major battles, uh, he would write out, uh, I'm sorry, on the eve of the major battle there's at D-Day, he would write out a note explaining that he bore full responsibility for anything under his command that had gone wrong. On June 5th, 1944, the day before D-Day, he wrote this. Well, if this doesn't tear your heart out. Our landings in the Cherbourg Havre area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold. I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. What a mensch. And where does this come from? Again, I know that I'm being repetitious here, and it's repetition with a purpose. Go back to the snapshot of the little hot-headed boy. Go back to the snapshot of the guy who didn't realize how important it was to smile and set everybody's limbic system in coordination. Go back to the kid at West Point who was full of hijinks and a, a very mediocre academic record. Nothing, nothing in that background prepared the world for who they were dealing with when Eisenhower came into full bloom. It's one of the mysteries of leadership. I don't have all the answers. I can, you know, put my neat little diagrams for pedagogical purposes, uh, which I do in workshops and for students on the board. But ladies and gentlemen, ultimately it's a mystery. That's what makes history so interesting. I can't answer it. It's open to speculation. You come up with as good an answer as any of us by just looking in your own heart and looking at the times when you've either had to lead or you've looked at other people and how they've led effectively. But this combination of skills, all of the skills I've told you about, Eisenhower leading the organization, it was most unusual to have them in the abundance Eisenhower had. Another leadership quality that Eisenhower possessed was his common touch, his ability to make ordinary Americans, ordinary soldiers, feel at ease with him. He was such an unpretentious man. He genuinely enjoyed being with people. He didn't put on airs. Part of his easy charm was displayed in the famous Ike Grimm that we've discussed, but his affinity for others went much deeper. As he said to those under his command, oh, and this is powerful, quote, I cannot let a day pass without telling the fighting men that my proudest boast shall always be I was their fellow soldier. Humility, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't put himself above them. He was primus inter pares. Only first among equals, but not above them. Finally, Eisenhower exuded confidence. He never shrank from duty or a tough challenge. The people around Ike found his can-do spirit contagious. This is how he moved teams, and it's how he moved an organization, whether it was the Executive Office of the United States, the United States, NATO, Colombia, uh, Shafe, wherever he was, he knew how to mobilize his heart with that can-do spirit. People needed a leader who possessed the inner resources to get through ordeals that would make other men go wobbly in the knees. I mean, as Tom Brokaw has said about in The Greatest Generation, we know all the challenges that generation faced, a generation born around 1890, with the first war, the Depression, the second war, when human civilization itself was at stake. And ladies and gentlemen, remember what these wars were, the worst wars in human history to that time, combined, what Churchill called the 20th century's 30 years war from 1914 to 1945, basically, World Wars I and two, 60 million human beings perished in those conflicts. The uh, nature of warfare changed. Men and women had to think differently to comprehend that kind of carnage. Eisenhower adapted to it. Ike's confidence expressed itself in the challenges he was willing to take on, and just as 
As Ike sought to be the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, so he wanted to be President of the United States in both arenas. He believed he could do the job. June 6, 1944, Eisenhower was arguably the most powerful man in the world. On his shoulders lay the burden of the greatest amphibious invasion ever. The war was a pressure cooker that required Ike to develop himself inside, from the inside out, develop his leadership. He knew the gravity of combat, the importance of vision, the necessity of conceiving and executing a good plan. He understood the requirements of diplomacy, the importance of communicating with the press, and the need to inspire ordinary men and women to extraordinary feats. All these qualities served Eisenhower well during World War II when he was Supreme Allied Commander. They prepared him eight years later to be the Commander-in-Chief of the United States and the leader of the free world. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you have questions. And I would love to entertain your questions. We can go further into his leadership, into this model, into the presidency. Yes, ma'am. Who was he, his mentor that you were talking about? Fox Conn. Who was he? He was a general in the army who, That's what I thought. yes, he he asked that Eisenhower come to Panama with him. Okay. And Eisenhower, people were starting to figure out that Eisenhower had great organizational talent. So whosoever staff he worked on, he made life easier. I mean, all bosses want somebody right there next to him who's a great organizer. It frees them up to do a lot of other things. And Eisenhower served devotedly. And he also just, Fox Connor was truly the kind of mentor who, who really cared. And so he cracked, he saw in Eisenhower what other people did not. You don't care about him. Very no, much. you don't. Yeah, that's why. But thank goodness for him, because yeah. he did a brilliant job with Eisenhower, his, his protege, mm -hmm. and gave him both the humane awareness that comes from deep reading. Here we are in a library. You know, I, I always say to students, <coughs> You know, if you don't read these books, you might as well burn them. If your generation does not read, the information in those books is gone. It's only good if it is read, absorbed, and taken into the mind. Eisenhower had not taken enough advantage of his high school and college education at West Point. Fox Connor seized him and made him a serious reader and student of history and, and world political economy. And this would serve Eisenhower so well because Connor was introducing him. This was for, um, Eisenhower's first assignment overseas for an extended period. And this would enable Eisenhower to start thinking about United States foreign relations, how to deal with, with um, foreign heads of state. And he became a student of international diplomacy and relations. And that's why he was so prepared. Now I give another talk on the presidency. I, in fact, I gave it just last week in another venue where I, had, I used that wonderful quotation that there is no preparation, no adequate preparation to become President of the United States. No job in this world is tougher. One of the reasons of the way the Constitution set it up. So many countries nowadays, they look at the United States experience and they say, we're going to split up into two people. We'll have the President of our country, as in Germany, be the head of state, and we'll have the Prime Minister or Chancellor be the head of the government. Well, our President in effect, as head of state and head of government, there's no way one human being adequately can encompass the job of president. But I've tried to show you that Eisenhower's preparation, uh, his training, his vision, we haven't gone into his vision yet, uh, he had amazing uh, imaginative capacity to see where warfare was going. It was in the tank. He knew tanks. He believed in tanks. In fact, Eisenhower almost was court-martialed for being an advocate of the tank when he was a junior officer. And the head of infantry said, if you keep this up, I'm going to bust you. He was almost court-martialed. So this preparation, this education, would be very important to Eisenhower all through um, and his presidency, all the way to the end, and would feed his vision, certainly. Yes, sir? Did, did President Eisenhower ever take public or private responsibility for his involvement in the Bay of Pigs. 
I know it was under Kennedy's watch, but he basically, with the CIA, said, we ought to do this. Well, here's one of the interesting things about the Bay of Pigs. Remember when I said that the Eisenhower presidency was noted for two things, the hidden hand behind the scenes and also a chief of staff? Eisenhower set up an entire structure of the presidency that was very much mirroring what he had understood the good command uh, structure to be in the military. So the parts were very well coordinated. Kennedy dismantles Eisenhower's structure. And historians looking back at the Bay of Pigs say that the essential problem was that the military was not talking to intelligence. So he had a breakdown in communication. Interestingly, had Kennedy kept the old man's, the old generation's structure, uh, Bay of Pigs might have had a happier outcome or maybe the United States would not have encouraged anybody to do anything at that time. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. So I, I didn't realize that. So Kennedy dismantled the, the channel between the intelligence and the military. That's right. Huh. That's right. So <clears throat> Bay of Pigs was a result of intelligence not talking to the military. Yes, sir, please. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about so how many Supreme Court nominees did uh, Eisenhower uh, make? And, and, and what was his process as a leader uh, for choosing those uh, people? Okay, Earl Warren was his most controversial surprise. I believe he had three in all. And Earl Warren was uh, the most controversial. Eisenhower purportedly said later that he regretted that particular choice for uh, Supreme Court. Um, Warren, though, of course, had distinguished himself in California and uh, seemed to be able, but you have to put it in a larger context. Eisenhower re represented modern republicanism, which you can translate into moderate republicanism, as opposed to the old guard and Senator Taft in Ohio, who were much more conservative, self-consciously conservative. And Barry Goldwater is going to pick up the old guard's mantle. Richard Nixon, for example, had been uh, to appease, and he was selected the vice president to appease the old guard. So Eisenhower was canny enough to know that the long-term impact of his presidency would come through the Supreme Court because that's a lifelong appointment. So when he picks somebody who's downright liberal, uh, and, and uh, I believe William Brennan was another one of his, uh, now Brennan was more liberal than Warren. But Warren was a, a, would be classified as a liberal Republican. Brennan was just a liberal. And there was a third. Help me out. Who was the third appointee? Franklin. Pardon? Not Franklin. Uh, no, that would have been earlier. But anyway, where it really counted in the presidency and where the president had a long-term cultural impact was in his Supreme Court appointees. And this, of course, made conservatives so upset. And it made, okay, yeah, the fact that you gave us Nixon and the vice presidency, you know, you really tricked us with the uh, Supreme Court. Because now we see your true liberal colors. But Eisenhower, remember, Eisenhower had learned the value of diplomacy and working with a variety of people in the war. If he could bring together people like de Gaulle and Churchill around a plan, he knew how to bring people together, and he valued the consensus builder. He had a genius at it. And so he thought, he, he approached politics the same way, based on his army experience. He called himself a, you know, a relatively conservative man, but liberal when it came to people, which is an interesting point. And this is why, now we can get into the whole history. Um, I mean, we could really do three or four lectures on Eisenhower, because if you get into the history of how he ran his campaign, in 1952 for president. He was not going to dismantle Social Security. In fact, he called for health care reform. And the health care reform that he called for would have the government underwriting private policies. Mm -hmm. Difference in degree, uh, difference in kind with Truman, who wanted uh, health care to be expanded by the government itself. Uh, it had been attempted for about 50 years to that point. So Eisenhower is already considered quite progressive. He's way ahead of, of his time compared to most Republicans. So uh, you, you look back on some of his moderate policies, his, his upholding the New Deal, uh, the minimum wage rises under his administration with his blessing. Um, 
Again, Little Rock, when you think about race relations, now people say he was dragged somewhat into Little Rock, but as soon as Governor Fall was down in Alabama, uh, Arkansas, uh, allowed violence to take place, and the National Guard did not intervene muscularly. That's when Eisenhower nationalized the Arkansas National Guard to make sure justice and order were restored. Wasn't it the first time that was done? Was that the first time that was done, wasn't it? That he actually, I mean, the first time that a president had done something like that. Well, it, under the organization of the National Guard as you knew it, yes. yes. Of course, you had militias previous to the National yeah. Guard that during wartime were nationalized, uh, the Civil War, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're right, under the modern National Guard, that would have been the first time uh, that, well, no, um, Truman. Truman, uh, in breaking some of the strikes, also had nationalized. Yes. Yes, sir. If I recall, uh, one of the criticisms uh, the Democrats had of Eisenhower was that whenever he had a crisis, he formed a committee. How accurate is that criticism? Well, he did, in that, remember, as a general, he was used to getting information from a variety of sources, and this is part of the hidden hand. He would gather a lot of people who had expertise, and uh, he, he would uh, make sure that he had the best information. Uh, in that sense, he performed the way Harvard Business School would tell a lot of people to handle a crisis. But your point is interesting about the problem with Democrats underneath this criticism. Go back and look at 1948 when Harry Truman wanted Eisenhower to succeed him as president uh, in 1952 running as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And Eisenhower said, sorry, I can't do it. I'm a, I'm a conservative when it comes to public policy. I'm a liberal when it comes to people, but I am, I'm really a Republican, not a Democrat. And um, damn, Truman never forgave him. Uh, they, they, they had... They had problems. Uh, now Truman had nominated him to be head of NATO, but there was really a falling out after that, and, and uh, they never quite recovered. In fact, Truman is the one who really was the, the source that fed many of the rumors about the Kay Summersby affair. Uh, he told the story about Marshall and so forth. So it, yeah, it, it, there was bad blood between Eisenhower and the Democrats at that point. Ironic given that Eisenhower was so moderate a Republican. <clears throat> Kennedy, you contrast, since we're focused on 1960 here, really the contrast, the brilliant contrast is between Kennedy and Eisenhower in terms of military policy, because Kennedy is the one who looks much more like Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Develops the Green Beret, develops the Army, Navy, the Air Force, so that there's a flexible response to any crisis. Eisenhower tended to want to rely, to balance the budget, on more of a nuclear deterrent. So uh, it, it's just interesting that uh, the Democratic hawkish president that followed Eisenhower actually had the more uh, militaristic approach and gives an inaugural address on January 20th, 1961, where he basically says, we will bear any burden and pay any price for freedom around the world. Kennedy's inaugural address is a foreign policy address. There's hardly a domestic word in it. It's about foreign this, foreign that, anti-communist this, anti-communist that. The Democratic Party has forgotten who Kennedy was. If you go back and look at the platform, if you look at what he actually said, everything from the tax cuts to the hawkish military approach, saying we're going to fight those damn commies everywhere, basically. Eisenhower is the one who looks like the moderate in that context. We'll trim our military, our conventional forces, and we'll just keep everybody scared that we're actually going to use nuclear weapons. This is why one of the ways he ended Korea, the Korean conflict, that was one of his campaign pledges in 1952. He basically let it be known through the Indian ambassador, let it be known to the Red Chinese, remember how we used to call them the Red Chinese? Let it be known to the Red Chinese that he would use nuclear weapons against the Chinese and North Koreans. Oh, everybody backs off. And so then he achieves the cam campaign promise of, of getting an armistice, getting a truce to uh, the Korean War, which technically, of course, has never ended. It is just a truce. Technically, the Korean War has never ended. We're still there. We're still there. And the North and the South are still. They are 
They, they've only stood down a little bit. It's not a hot war, but they are still technically, legally, at war. Any other questions you have? Yes, sir. I'm going back. How did he happen to go to West Point? That's an interesting story. It was a miracle that he ever got to West Point. I believe he was 19 years old when he applied to the military academy at West Point and to Annapolis, the Naval Academy, coming out of his high school. And um, he was too old, he learned, to follow through with the appointment to the Naval Academy. So, yes, he was too old. So that meant he had to have the congressman in his district focus on West Point. He was second. Eisenhower was, was second in the queue to get the congressional appointment to West Point. And when the, then the guy ahead of him, remember Eisenhower was not a great student, the guy ahead of him there in Kansas um, uh, had a uh, physical disability of some kind that was discovered and so could not go. So then Eisenhower being second in line got the appointment to West Point. That's how he got to West Point. So was his dad a military? No, his, his dad worked in a creamery in Abilene, Kansas, and really didn't have that military background. Um, this is why, really, he looked, you know, Eisenhower looked at West Point as a way to keep playing football and to get a little bit of higher education. But what was going on in the, in the world then? It, well, this would have been in 1911. So this is before World War I. World War I is going to break out in August of 1914. Uh, the Titanic would sink during his sophomore year. So this, that's what's going on in the world. Uh, we've had a long peace since the Congress of Vienna in 1815. We had a hundred, basically, Western civilization enjoyed with, you know, the Crimean War and some things, but basically Western civilization had a hundred years of peace. The major wars, of course, during that time, the Crimean War, our civil war, this is why so many observers came over from Europe, they didn't have any wars over there to observe. So they had to come over here to observe what modern warfare would look like. And, of course, you had been the Spanish-American War, which lasted, what, 90 days? Uh, hardly, a, hardly a protracted war. Then we had the Philippine insurrection, our first war in a jungle in Asia, 1903, uh, in which um, 4,000 Americans were killed. A little, little bit of a foreshadowing of Vietnam there. But, uh, Theodore Roosevelt waged. Uh, you had the Russo-Japanese War, and you had some conflicts in the Balkans, but nothing like Napoleon on the one side of this period, and the invasion with the Grande Armée of the rest of Europe, and nothing like World Wars I and II on the other side of this period in Europe. So to go into the military, uh, yeah, uh, get a college degree out of this, and I get to play some football. It's really remarkable. That's again why I take you back to the snapshot of Eisenhower. If you had taken him and shaken him and said, son, do you realize you are going to be the greatest military hero on the face of the earth in 30 some odd years? He would have said, you're flipping crazy. <laughs> 34 years, 33 years later, one of the greatest military heroes of all time. It's an amazing story. Uh, is history, are they beginning, you hear a little bit more about this because for, I'm, I grew up in that. I'm, an Eisenhower person, and that, you know, that was my age. <laughs> so, uh, and we liked him. But history didn't treat him, I mean, afterwards it was sort of as if he was just, uh, oh well, you know, he was just, as you said, this that's a, golfer. That's, <laughs> that, that's a very good point. And I, I've yeah. always wondered about that, because at the time, at the time when he was president, at the time when he was during World War II, which my generation brought in, I, I, we felt he was just, you know, a marvelous leader. And I can't, so I always said, what is this that you're just looking at this guy and saying, oh, you know, he's sort of a lightweight. He's not, history isn't going to remember him. Except for World War II. But as a president, he didn't, uh, it's because he worked behind the scenes. That's right. He did not need the glory, and he, he had watched what yeah. Montgomery's behavior had done he had to, to hurt the British cause. He watched what Patton's behavior had done to hurt himself. Uh, That's he had, what I thought. He had watched de Gaulle, you know, act childish, frankly, because the Resistance was not getting enough PR, 
in the lead up to D-Day, he saw that these giant egos were hurting the larger purpose. And, and the, one of the reasons Eisenhower, his life has been revisited, and his leadership has been revisited, is because he seemed to be able to check his ego. He did not need to be the guy out front and center. In fact, he didn't mind. He was also laughed at for speaking ungrammatically at his press yeah, conferences sure. and made fun of. Yeah. But actually, when Fred Greenstein and others have gone back to look, they think he was deliberately doing that so the journalists would keep, wait a second, what playing with the syntax, like they kept and they the couldn't syntax. figure out what he yeah. said. And Eisenhower actually achieved his purpose by saying a lot of words that no one could safely interpret when Eisenhower had to buy time and be ambiguous. The guy was brilliant. He's one of the best pro stylists among the 43 men who've served as President of the United States. He's one of the, the very finest pro stylists with that concision of language, the yeah. concision and precision of word choice. Good question. Well, it's interesting because you felt at the time, you know, he's, he's canny and he's effective. And why are they saying he's just this lightweight? <laughs> Well, and again, to have the genius to do the hidden hand presence, yeah. to get Sherman Adams out there, you know, where he stays sort of above the fray. This is a tradition, really, that goes all the way back to George Washington in some sense, where Washington tried to stay above the fray. It would be undignified for a George Washington to jump into the direct political battles. He had able lieutenants do those things for him, uh, ambitious men like Hamilton and Jefferson. So Eisenhower, I think, um, he understood from the, the experience in the Army that he did not need to, to get down and dirty with, with the, uh, the politicians. I mean, and nowadays, of course, look at what happens. I mean, presidents nowadays seem to get sucked into the silliest uh, brouhaha's, and it, it has demeaned the office somewhat. Uh, Eisenhower had a sense of propriety and restraint. You let the Sherman Adamses of the world do his, his uh, sucker punches for him. Okay, well, any other questions? Sir, did you have one? Yeah, I was just, um, the other presidents that you had mentioned that were generals, other than maybe Washington, were really not very good presidents, at least at that level. And I guess maybe with Eisenhower, it was the way you were explaining his skills with leadership, or, or what would make him... Jackson, for example, while a very powerful president, was a president who alienated a lot of people, too. Whether it's people in South Carolina over the nullification controversy, or his handling of the Cherokee Indians, or, you know, there were a number of, of steps that Jackson took that did not show a lot of diplomacy. Eisenhower truly was the genius among the generals, and I think being thrown into at this great international coalition to defeat Tojo and fascism and Nazism honed that great uh, political instinct of Eisenhower's so that he could work with people of all backgrounds. And isn't that what we're seeking today? When I again and again see the commentary on the news, you know, about the polarization, where's bipartisan spirit? Where are the people? Even when Reagan, I, I remember the news coverage during the Reagan era was that everybody was polarized, but you know, you all know the story. You know, Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Uh, could go at it hammer and tongs during the day, and then at five o'clock, the two old Irishmen would say, "Let's go have a drink," and they would they would they would have a drink, and they would tell jokes, and they had comedy. tea. Um, George W. Bush, uh, very very uh, gracious, when Ted Kennedy passed away, uh, we learned that that George W. Bush and Ted Kennedy actually got along behind the scenes. Go figure. I mean. It's, it's complex. That's increasingly rare, apparently. Um, so I think to find a president who's honed all of those diplomatic and political skills to work with people who think differently, speak different languages, come from different ethnic backgrounds, continents away, is a terribly important skill. And it gave Ike such great credibility when he advocated on behalf of the United States. And he also knew he was tough. Look at the Suez Crisis and how he got France and Britain to back off in the Suez Crisis. I mean, Eisenhower was not just a go-along, get-along golfer. You know, this was a guy who was a tough competitor when he had to be. So he would be the diplomat 
and smooth as, as long as he could, but he knew when to flex his muscles. And boy, that kind of experience for guys about 60 years old, that kind of experience. I mean, you know, we started the evening with that little list of all those nice things, houses, new houses that cost $16,500. You know, stamps that were four cents. Chubby Checker, the twist. We started out with that because it set a tone, a limbic system tone. And I think Eisenhower very much was proud of the legacy, proud of the way he left the country at the end of the 50s. By 1960, the economy was in good shape. Uh, we did not have the missile gap that John F. Kennedy talked about. That was disingenuous of Kennedy in the debates with Nixon. Uh, the country was in great shape. Culture was wholesome. It had freedom and room for the challenges of the beat generation. Um, it was a different time. And I think Americans will look increasingly, not to go back nostalgically to the 50s. That ain't going to happen. That dog's run through the fence. We're never going to recreate the 50s. And I don't even know that people would ever really want to do that. But what about the principles of our community then? where we do start to address in this country, you know, uh, three centuries, three and a half centuries up to that point of, of racial tension with blacks. There, there was a social conscience. There was room for cultural experimentation. But it was in a context of civility. The politics worked better. Joseph McCarthy had been isolated, alienated, and finished off uh, in a second uh, Red Scare, in essence. The country got through it. You wonder now, are we kind of going into a permanent sort of red scare where we, we created uh, domestic crises in this country where people are really drawing battle lines and we don't have the committee and the, um, the people with this great diplomatic skill that maybe the greatest generation, its, uh, it's fathers had, its fathers and mothers. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being here in this beautiful facility. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.